Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode six in the Experts Assessment Series. While we wait for, wait for everyone to trickle into the live stream, please drop us a line and let us know where you're, call, or you're tuning in from and just say hello. We have a really spectacular panel discussion lined up for today, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But before I do so, I want to go over the format with you. We'll first go through the entire session, and toward the end, we'll have a Q&A um, opportunity. So be sure to drop your questions into the chat box, and our panelists will get to as many of those questions as we can during the hour. As always, after today's session, you'll be able to find this webinar and other amazing content from IFMA in the IFMA Coronavirus Resource Center. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dean Stanberry, IFMA's second vice chair of the Global Board of Directors, who'll be moderating today's session. Over to you, Dean. Good morning, and thank you all for joining today in this uh, sixth session in the Experts Assessment. Uh, so uh, let me go ahead and start by introducing our panel for today. Uh, we have, um, if we can go to that slide, we have Jeffrey Saunders, who is the CEO of Nordic Foresight. Uh, Nordic Foresight is the company that actually created our um, Delphi, real-time Delphi survey, and Jeff will be going into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, we have with us today Manish Kumar, who is a Senior Vice President of Digital Buildings for Schneider Electric. Uh, we have Gina Elliott, who is a Vice President of Strategy for Switch Automation. And for those that are not aware, Switch Automation is a uh, fault detection and diagnostics tool, uh, one of the up and coming ones in the marketplace. And we have uh, Jeremy McDonald, who is the Director of Global Energy and Sustainability for ISS. Uh, for those in North America, you may not be familiar with ISS, but they are a uh, very large uh, European um, facility management and, uh, and uh, cleaning company. Uh, so they are uh, very big in Europe, uh, not as much of a presence in the US, but a great panel uh, representing a, an international perspective today. So let's go on to our next slide. Uh, so our topic is really uh, COVID-19 uh, derailing sustainable buildings. Um, so going to the next. What we'll be talking about is the Delphi survey results on sustainability. So what did we learn from these international experts and how COVID-19 or post-COVID-19 will affect our efforts in sustainability? How that ongoing pandemic uh, changes how organizations plan and implement sustainable solutions for the built environment? And what are the impacts on uh, facilities management for strategy setting uh, services uh, budgets and uh, the skills required, which is a very big topic. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Jeff Saunders now, who is going to walk us through some of those uh, specific findings for the sustainable uh, components of the post COVID-19 study. Thank you. Thank you, Dean, for the great introduction and good afternoon and good morning, everyone. I'm really excited about today's topic and I'm looking forward to walking you through um, the you know some of the findings from the real time Delphi, the experts assessment, the workplace post COVID nineteen, um, and I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to the methodology. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the methodology, please download the executive summary. We'll give you uh, links and details on how to do that. Um, what this study um, was intended to do was to help develop your resiliency and your readiness uh, for the future of the built environment post COVID-19. And we did this by doing a month long real time Delphi, which facilitates the um, interactions of a geographically diverse and professionally, di professionally diverse group of subject matter experts. We brought together 248 of them from around the world, and they interacted and engaged for over a month, um, participating in a debate which uh, elicited 2,500 comments, um, 1,500 revisions as they each were answering questions, reviewing each other's comments, and revising their answers to actually develop and reach a consensus. Um, and we also were able to harvest these in insights, identify where um, perspectives differed, captured those, and I'll be walking through just one of these chapters today. And that chapter is, of course, on sustainability and the question of did the COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing economic downturn that we've experienced in various degrees in markets around the world, is that derailing our de developments and sustainability as it concerns the built environment. 
Next slide, please. Now we have to recognize that um, there was many communities of practice across IFMA that helped us uh, bring together and um, develop the um, Delphi study. So we had um, participants from the Environmental and Sustainability, where Dean is the chair of that community practice, but we also had workplace evolutionaries, operation and maintenance, um, business leadership, um, as well an IT community and the real estate advisory all um, participating in making sure that this study came in um, to being. Next slide, please. So one thing we wanna do is we wanna hear your insights um, because we had the insights of the subject matter experts. We wanna hear your perspectives on what is actually occurring in your organizations out there in the field. So we um, prepared a, sli a, a short Slido poll. If you go to slido.com, um, hashtag W80, W086, if you fill that in when a little marker comes up, or if you have a QR enabled smartphone, take a snapshot of the QR code, it will bring you to that uh, questionnaire. And what we want you to do is to answer the question about how has the pandemic affected your organization's sustainability agenda? Um, has it accelerated your sustainability activities? Has it put them on hold um, or has it reduced your sustainability activities or um, you don't know, or maybe don't, uh, um, the question may not be relevant for you, but please provide your insights. We're really interested in hearing your perspectives. Yeah, so this is a great insight. We can see, you know, that there's a slight leaning, and this is actually something that is uh, mirroring our findings from the uh, from the Delphi. A quite split panel when it comes to our responses so far. I'm looking to see for see as we move forward about how this develops. But it looks like there's a slight leaningness leaning towards accelerating our sustainability activities. Um, while well, there's a split between putting things on hold and actually reducing. So that's quite interesting. Please continue to answer uh, the poll as we move forward through the presentation. I'm really looking forward to seeing the final results as we move forward. So um, I just want to, you know, reiterate and um, for all of you out there, I'm sure many of you are familiar with sustainability, but I just want to emphasize that it is not only a conversation about the environmental aspects of the built environment, but there's other aspects around the social engagement, um, the profitability, the economic viability, and the equality of access and things like that. Many of these you could reference according to the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And if you aren't familiar with them, I strongly recommend that you check them out. And actually, if you're looking for inspiration about what other um, FM communities are doing, you should actually take a look to Northern Europe and the Dutch facility management community and the uh, Danish facility management community, what they're doing um, as well, because they're actually driving hard on applying the sustainable development goals in the FM and built environment. So if any of you participated in World Workplace Europe, if this World Workplace Europe, you can see some of the activities that they're doing there as well. Um, now, next slide, please. Just to reiterate the impacts, and again, this is not just environmental and it's not only about climate change, the challenges that we're seeing and the reason why the focus on the built environment is so important is that globally buildings account for 35% of resource usage, 40% of energy uses, 12% of potable or consumable uh, water consumption, and 40% of carbon emissions. And the impacts that climate change in particular um, will have on the built environment will pose a number of challenges for you. You know, there's challenges around the air quality issues, around pollution and allergens, health related issues, you know, this being the pandemic and many people are caught believing that COVID-19 actually emerged from the ways that we use the environment. And that led to, you know, the whole um, development of, of um, development of the, of the, um, 
of the virus itself and its spread to the population at large. Um, rising sea levels, water, um, all these things and weather issues are all the things that we'll have to deal with um, and it impacts the climate change. So either we're doing things to reduce our impacts or we're gonna have to deal with the mitigation factors and remediation factors caused by climate change. Next slide, please. So the key finding about this, when we look in relationship to the real-time Delphi, is that this was actually the most contentious portion of um, the real-time Delphi survey. And we actually did not achieve consensus. And as we were looking at our slide poll, there was kind of an even split across how companies are responding um, to, to COVID. There was a slight leaning towards environmentally sustainable solutions um, but there wasn't a clear indication that this was by and large the way things were going. And actually the panelists were kind of split and they were kind of making comments around how they hoped that things would be developing, but um, you know they were not expecting them to de be developed. And we'll go into this in greater detail as we move forward. Next slide, please. So one of the things to think about, and this kind of cuts through all the um, real-time Delphi surveys, um, presentations and expert assessment series that we've done so far, the other episodes, is that we're at, you know, obviously going through a remote re working revolution. We've all been kicked, our majority of knowledge workers have been kicked to working um, from home. And the question is, how will this develop moving forward? And 81% of subject matter experts that we surveyed believe that 26% of workers will be working remotely most of the time. And many surveys since the real-time Delphi was conducted had confirmed this result. Um, there's recently been a survey of commercial real estate owners that was just released last week, where 80% um, of, of the surveyed real estate owners confirmed this assessment. They believe that um, the majority of companies will be switching to a hybrid work model with most people working uh, three days a week from the office, two days a week from home. Next slide, please. And this has a number of implications on the built environment and urban development. Now, globally, um, there were some regional differences. The majority of the subject matter experts we surveyed believed that organizations would make greater use of co-working sites, satellite office, and new types of office spaces. And over the long term, this would have fundamental impacts on urban development and potentially could lead to an oversupply, particularly in the office um, Kind of office segment um, for many, many years to come. Next slide, please. And so this will fundamentally lead to a change in the demand for real estate. So many of our subject matter experts pointed towards the demand for class C and class B types of buildings. And these are buildings with less attractive uh, locations, um, also typically are older. Um, and so they actually have a great, they're also in need of a much more investments to upgrade their um, energy efficiency, water efficiency, and things like that. These will become less attractive and the market will shift towards greater usage of new hybrid working solutions through co-working locations and class A buildings, which will become much more attractive. So we'll see a fundamental shift, which poses a question about what do we do about these class C and B buildings? How do we make them more sustainable? What type of investments should we use? Or should we start thinking about alternatives and use these buildings as maybe material banks where we actually think about how do we break them down in better and more useful ways so we can use the resources in them to upgrade other facilities better? Next slide, please. Um, and this is leading to the shift in the way organizations are planning their works put, work, uh, workplace strategies, and they're actually implementing a number of ways um, and buildings and spaces for their workers to work, working from home and the services around supporting that, working near home options, either through a co-working location or through other uh, hybrid model, collaborative headquarters will become emergent, um, event spaces that are used, and then a number of technology platforms um, that will be integrating all these factors together. Um, and we're seeing many of these technology platforms in our, next slide please, in our panel uh, will be speaking and can speak to all these things about aspects about how we use these platforms to manage the workers' experience, of course, but also to guide the sustainability um, um, interventions in the built space more effectively. Everything from the construction phase of things to the operations and the analytics and the visualizations around making the management more beneficial. But we'll get into detail on that um, through our panel debate.
Now, this transition is leading to a number of opportunities and challenges. Um, on the one side, um, we're seeing a fundamental decline in the amount of investments being made in buildings currently in 2020, that we're seeing um, signs of recovery, and this could pause uh, investments in sustainable uh, solutions. Um, the question is, how long does that pause last? Um, it also um, can, can cause us to think about um, how we how we use uh, single use items and things like that, that we thought we had under control. Cause what we're seeing is also an increased use of disposable masks, disposable wipes, all these other things, which are actually exploding under the pandemic. Um, but it is also having a number of positive shifts. We're traveling less, we're doing less international travel, things like that. We're using solutions like this to engage and interact with each other. So a lot of these things are having actual benefit um, to things moving forward. And if you saw the BBC today, there are actually discussions about imposing uh, uh, frequent flyer taxes on individuals to compensate for their environmental footprints. It's also leading to a shift in the investment priorities, particularly if you look at um, institutional investors, pension funds, um, institutions like that. They're actually increasing their focus on environmental or ESG um, forms for uh, investment uh, engagement. And these are some of the things that are leading to new opportunities and new challenges that have to be mitigated. Next slide, please. Um, and so what we're seeing when we start looking into the, the studies in and of themselves is um, this question about awareness. Now, one of the big things that happened in the first phases of the pandemic, and we think back to March, April 2020, we think, wow, that was such a long time ago. Um, and what you saw in many places was the instantaneous environmental improvement that many of the major cities that experience around the world because people were not commuting the air quality increased dramatically and you've still had a large portion around 30 percent of the labor market to 40 percent of the labor market depending on the country continue to work from home and so the question is will this lead to a stronger awareness within organizations and among workers themselves that there's a new way to do things and that this could lead to a change in sustainability. And if you look at people who thought it was likely and highly likely, 65% of the subject matter experts believe that this pandemic and the visual consequences through less uh, airborne pollution would fundamentally change people's perspectives and lead to more sustainable forms of working. Next slide, please. We're also seeing um, this question about budgets. Now we have to think around the recovery. Last year, of course, the pandemic, um, we had a major drop off in investments um, in the built environment around the world. Um, but the question is over the long term, how would it impact the investments in real estate? Now the panel was very split over this issue and it gently leaned towards an, a majority thinking that um, there would be an increased uh, availability for budgets in efficiency improvements and investments and in things around uh, waste improvements, um, energy and water, um, that these will increase. And this quote that we have here from one of the subject matter experts is kind of really indicative of this. Of this. And he says, I'm going to take a real leap here and I'm going for it. Um, there will probably be a reduction in real estate footprint post COVID. Some of that money could be invested in energy efficiency improvements um, and these will pay back over the long term. But this question around hope was actually driving many of the people's responses. And you could fear that there was a, maybe an expectation that while we should be doing the right things, that more short sighted um, financially driven considerations may come into play and delay um, investments as we move forward. Next slide, please. Um, again, we're coming into this prioritization and just as with the awareness that we're more aware of things, that these changes that we're seeing will actually lead to a fundamental shift in uh, how organizations actually engage in the work practices, leading to a more environmentally sustainable development. And again, the majority of people who thought highly likely or um, moderately likely they believed that they would move forward and, and would see a transition in the prioritization. Now, this gives an overview of kind of the discussions and the debate and the changes. And this is just, um, you know, kind of hitting the surface and we get to the next slide, please. 
And we can see that these are some of the findings that we had um, across um, the focus on sustainability. We just scratched the surface. And what I really want to do is engage our great panel who's waiting, um, biting at the bit to engage in this conversation around sustainability and their experiences with their customers and clients around how is it actually occurring a year later into the pandemic and whether it truly is hope um, versus an expectation that re of reaction that engaged uh, many of the SME responses. What's engaging the marketplace now? This is what we love to hear from our fantastic panel. Um, but before I kick it back to Dean to engage in that debate, um, I would call for you a call for action to download the executive summary where we provide an overview of not just this chapter, but all the other chapters in the study. And you can uh, do that at experts.ifma.org. And I um, strongly urge you to download the report there. And now with that brief overview from the study, hitting in on some of the topics around sustainability, I'd like to give the word back to Dean. Thank you, Jeff. That was a great overview of uh, this particular topic. And I do encourage everybody to uh, download uh, the survey and, and read it. There's really a lot of insights. Um, as everybody has been talking about the immediate return to work strategy, this is really trying to take a, a longer uh, view out of uh, what are we looking at over the next uh, three, five or, or 10 years. Uh, so again, um, just to Reintroduce our panel. We have Manish Kumar with uh, Snyder Electric, and Gina Elliott with Switch Automation, and Jeremy McDonald with uh, ISS. So let's uh, let's bring up our first question. We did have a few uh, prepared questions, and then we'll be also taking questions from the audience. So the first one we have is, um, you know, there's been some predictions you saw in the one slide that Jeremy showed that uh, there will be a decline in the uh, demand for commercial real estate in the post COVID-19 environment. So the question is, how is it going to change and how will architecture and design change? And I want to uh, ask Gina to uh, lead off and uh, take us through her response and we'll get the other two as well. Well, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dean. I uh, appreciate that. So that's, um, that's actually something that uh, I put a lot of thought into prior to even this session. And I think what we're going to see is, or in my thoughts, pretty indicative of what you've seen in the study. I think that um, we're going to see the building follow the migration of the workers. So if those workers are moving out to the suburbs, I think you're going to see uh, design of uh, buildings, smaller footprints. I think you're going to see uh, design where there's more open space. Um, I think you're going to see some of it move out of the urban areas. I also think that you're going to see uh, a lot of more satellite offices. And I also think you're going to see a lot of mixed use, so um, development. And I think that not only is it just an impact of COVID, but there are other impacts on commercial real estate coming from things like uh, retail and, and it's com competitive online and what that's done with retail. So, I think you're going to see some transformation or transition of things like indoor malls um, and I think maybe some repurposing of those things as well because you find a lot of, you know, malls, shopping malls in urban areas or I'm sorry, suburban areas. So I think that's going to be part of that. I also think that um, if you look at if you look at some of the retail stand on retail for a moment. If you look at some of the, the retails, uh, Taco Bell, for instance, just announced that they're going to have a whole new redesign of, of their, um, their retail stores. And they're going smaller and they're going to have more open space. Uh, they're going to have more curbside pickup and things like that. So you're going to see that because that's going to be a way for real estate to manage some of their risk. So I, I think there's also the fear of what if this comes back? You know, it's the, this is a year plus going into it. So how do we manage that risk? So I there's not much I would disagree with what was in the study. I do think again to reiterate, smaller footprint. Um, it, we're going to see more into suburban areas. I think we're going to see more uh, space needed, outdoor space as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Jeremy, uh, you have uh, probably an international perspective with uh, ISS. You work as the uh, Director of Global Energy and Sustainability. What are you hearing on that front? 
Sure. I mean, we've seen some of these changes starting already. Um, I'll focus a little on the U.S., where several large companies have announced moving headquarters or closing down space. But so we see a difference across segments, though. Whereas our life sciences manufacturing companies that we work with are either the same demand they had before or even increasing. So I think it depends a lot on segment. Um, and then those those supplies of buildings open up, right? No one can really estimate how much increased demand there will be for startups and other companies that are, are ready to go and use that space and what other mixed use opportunities exist. So I'm, I'm a little, I'm not sure how to predict that, but I do anticipate a lot more user choice, right? If workers are going out to other locations, like Gina mentioned, if buildings follow, workplaces follow the workers, then that's their choice where they go. And I'm curious how the models emerge where developers were doing whole buildings for whole clients at one point. Now are they trying to build shared space for individual users? Where do they find that supply that helps them feel like they should build additional structures in non, you know, central districts? Okay. Um... Manish, how is uh, Schneider Electric approaching this? I know you're working with their smart uh, buildings uh, technologies, but Schneider is also a large electrical infrastructure uh, company, and uh, so this would affect their um, part of their core business. Uh, thanks, uh, Dean, uh, for the question. First, I would like to compliment uh, Nordic Foresight and IFMA. I think it's a great study and lots of great insights, so I encourage everyone to download the study and read. I personally found it very, very useful. Coming back to the question on uh, workplaces, I would say I, I echo some of the comments made by Gina and Jeremy. I think we are seeing different type of trends. A is, I think, trend towards hybrid, flex desking, flex sort of space management. Those solutions will accelerate for those uh, uh, you know uh, uh, requirements or you know adoption of those solutions. I think also some of the people or some of the companies uh, are which are kind of you know trying to decrease uh, the the real estate use for workplaces but they are also looking for how do I upgrade and create a better uh, workplace environment so we're going to also see on one side uh, maybe the space a little bit reduced reduction but also people investing to upgrade the existing infrastructure to provide a better collaborative workplace environment and i think a lot of the technology are enabling some of those collaborative work uh, from a Schneider standpoint, I think uh, on our own real estate strategy, we are also a large company with a lot of real estate footprint. We are actually upgrading on the trend that you saw in the study is bringing a lot of those uh, flexible space management solution, better insight into how our space is used, uh, and really creating a better workplace environment collaboration for employees. Thank you. Um, I do have a, a, a question from... Um, it's actually coming through our chat here. This is coming from uh, Peter Ankersterney, who is uh, actually IFMA's um, chairman of the Global Board of Directors. And how will increased focus on sustainability influence the role and responsibility of FM? And if the panel doesn't mind, I'll take that because I'm actually a practicing uh, facility manager <laughs> or have been. Um, so one of the things in facility management is that we've seen that the demand for sustainability skills was really dependent on individual businesses, whether they had a focus on sustainability or not, uh, really drove whether or not the FM, um, you know, went out and got educated on that. And what I think we're going to see is that there will be an increase in uh, the, the focus on sustainable buildings. And as a result, there's going to be a number of FMs that uh, or facility managers that had not really studied that area before that are going to need to uh, go out and get educated on it. Um, one of the things we've said since the early 2000s, when LEED first emerged and we started, um, you know, giving uh, certifications to buildings, uh, one of the things they discovered is that, you know, a nice LEED Platinum building does not stay LEED Platinum for very long if you don't operate it sustainably. And so uh, that was one of those big aha moments that uh, you need to now train the people who have to operate the building if you want to maintain that level of sustainable performance over time. Okay, um, let's move on to the next question, which is, um, we'll have it on the screen here in a second. Uh, 
the demand for commercial if the demand for commercial real estate declines will that increase the demand for sustainable development features for the remaining building stock or will sustainable development also decline and jeremy i'm going to ask you to take the lead on uh, first-hand response to that sure thanks for the chance to speak to this one um so taking that assumption right the demand does decline i think the inverse outcome happens for the demand for sustainable development right we have more choice in where we work potentially and people who are looking for real estate will then be able to have higher demands for those things and i think sustainable features are now a priority it's not the kind of thing where we're focused so much on a perk within our workplace like a ping pong table we actually want to know our workplace is safe and healthy air quality access to light these features matter more than some of the fun perks we imagine, right? Um, and I do miss ping pong tables when I'm working from home, but I am happy that I have my window, my air, and all those other features. And I didn't always have that in a commercial real estate setting. Hmm, thank you. Uh, Jer Jeffrey, I think you wanted to uh, weigh in. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we had to think about, you know, this links also back to, to Peter's previous uh, question as well. Um, you know, you're going to have a greater demand in, from from the end user for sustainable solutions, but you also have to think about what implications does this have for um, the facility management function? And then the question, what do we do with all the um, excess capacity that we have? And how do we actually think about those buildings which are at the end of their life cycle? How do we repurpose them? Um, what do we do with the components within them? And the, the facility manager's responsibility of maybe thinking about that transition from operations into a deconstruction phase and what could they then do with those assets on hand. And I think there's some interesting movements um, and I recommend people who um, are in North America or other parts of the world to look at what's going on with some of the um, um, developments occurring in circular economy, particularly in Northern Europe, where they're actually you know, beginning discussions of thinking about buildings um, as material banks and how do you actually start thinking about the resources within those and the de deconstruction and doing that in a in a better more efficient way so you can actually recycle and upcycle building components in the build into the buildings that we uh, want to keep and use better thank you um, and Manish I think you had uh, wanted to weigh in on it yes uh, sure uh, Dean I think uh, if uh, anything that this pandemic has taught, uh, or, or I would say the positive uh, uh, side effect of this is that I think the awareness among people that we cannot take word for granted. I think uh, people are becoming more sensitive awareness on sustainability topic. I think that's pretty crazy, uh, visible also in the study. So we actually have more and more clients actually coming to us and you know asking Schneider to help in their sustainable journey. I think we are seeing more and more larger fortune 500 companies coming forward also investors coming forward are ready to commit to some ambitious sustainability goals so we are saying that even though there might be a decline in commercial real estate uh, coming back to jeremy's point we see uh, uh, aspiration or ambition on sustainability goals from customers is going to increase and i think the solutions are available today that people can embark on those journey and actually get to the sustainability goal that they are setting for themselves. Thank you. Gina, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm going to dissent. <laughs> so I'm going to say that sustainability is going to be driven by market demand, rules and regulations. And I think if you see the demand for commercial real estate decline, I don't think that's going to be an incentive for any of the building owners or operators to actually invest in them. Um, it would be an ideal offer, uh, opportunity for them, but they're going to be too worried, I think, about the, their economies to do that type of an investment. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to dissent on that one. I wish that was ideally different, but I don't think so. And um, <clears throat> we can also look at back when we had the Great Recession a few years ago, um, I think that's when Lee kind of had a little bit of, a, of its prominence then, but still, uh, that was 10 plus years ago, is, has anything changed? And I, I go back to, you know, what are the drivers for sustainability? 
and I, I don't see anyone, any of the operator, any of the building owners that are worried about, you know, low rents and, <clears throat> and high vacancies investing in more in their properties. So I just thought that. Yeah, maybe this gets back to the point about hope versus what will really happen. <laughs> but the <laughs> as a developer putting myself in their shoes, the idea is we want to extend the useful life of this asset we have. So if we can get a client to sign up for another five or 10 years by investing in a sustainability measure, we may be able to tie together the, the thing we're hoping for with the reality that comes from it. But I think this also raises an interesting point around the polarization in the market. Because um, one aspect is what the elite companies do, the Fortune 1000, Fortune 500 companies, and then um, the smaller companies. How do we actually incentivize and, and make sure that they're investing in their spaces and then the, the segments of the market that service those uh, tier two, two, tier three companies? What do we do to incentivize those? So we might have a situation where, yeah, you have a, a boom in, in sustainability um, activities targeted towards the elite companies. And then you have this large swath of tier two and tier three where they get continually get lagged behind. And then, of course, that becomes into what are the incentives um, and pushes um, that are coming in from the governments to do that. And you're seeing a lot of activity in Europe um, regarding um, um, the type of sustainable investments that need to be done there. Um, but then also with the new administration, the question is how long that lasts in the United States around a transition to more um, sustainable investments. Thank you all. And um, even though we're talking about commercial real estate, you know, when we extend that uh, conversation to residential, uh, that brings up a whole nother issue around, um, you know, what I've, what's been termed e equitable electrification. Uh, how are we going to propagate some of these uh, technologies and, and new features down to, um, to make it affordable for, you know, the average household, uh, the people that are, uh, you know, living paycheck to paycheck can't afford to go out and change change out their gas furnace for for electric or their gas range for electric um even uh you know extra insulation and things like that so a whole nother set of issues when we take it all the way through the entire um you know building uh industry from residential through commercial through that uh, elite uh core that uh, jeffrey mentioned dean can i add on to that yes one of my biggest concerns is that we've talked about commercial real estate, but um, at my house where I'm working from right now, uh, my square foot per user is much, much higher than when I was working in an office. Um, you know, and if I think about that, my whole house is at a certain temperature. The maintenance activities I do are are based on my financial decisions. I don't have a, a FM specialist dedicated full time to making this place run operationally, right? And shame on me for that being the case, but it is difficult to manage our own house the same way a FM credentialed person from IFMA would manage a large facility thinking about the economies of scale that come with that. So my concern around sustainability is as we, if we stay more residential, how do we make those changes you just described available to a larger group? Correct. And one of the conversations that I've heard is that, you know, from a commercial building standpoint, you know, uh, a, a business can determine, you know, what sort of sustainable features they offer in that building and, and the occupants then all take advantage of that. Um, and whether it's, you know, doing recycling or things like that. But when all of your workforce is now distributed and working from home, even if you have a corporate objective to be sustainable and things like that. How do you um, monitor those activities uh, when, when, you, when you're not there to see, you know, are they recycling? And uh, to your point, Jeremy, you know, I've got a very efficient house. I got solar on the roof. I drive an electric car, but the temperature is really determined by my spouse. Um, and that's, that's where it stays. So, so. <laughs> yep. We know the uh, VIP users of the building. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, Let's move on to our uh, next question. Um, this is an interesting one because we have lots of people on the panel uh, well equipped to answer it. And that is, what role will the advances in, in prop tech or property technology play in making buildings more sustainable? And um, Manish, I'm gonna ask you to lead off on that one. Thanks, Dean. Uh, so I, I think, uh, you know, we see uh, significant investment flowing into prop tech space. Uh, with the hope 
uh, that technology can solve some of these problems. And we already see a great example. So at Schneider Electric, we are trying to solve the problem in two ways, on supply side and demand side. I, if I start with demand side, I think today with IoT, cloud computing, analytics, machine learning, AI, we are able to see a lot of insights and details where buildings were run or being run inefficiently. Uh, as an example, we have a technology called Building Advisor with fault detection diagnostic. We are seeing uh, millions of uh, euro worth of energy saving potential in some of the building that has been, the technology has been installed. If we act on some of those tasks, it is possible to save energy and bring savings to our customer. And these are real example, practical example. The second is, uh, I think we are working on some of the advanced ideas where we can actually automate insights to action itself as well. Where people don't need to do that, but you know, technology will automatically take care of it. We call it autonomous building. If I go to the supply side on the mix of energy, uh, given that the cost of renewable is going down, we are also helping our customer procure uh, energy efficiently or with the right mix. It's another way to make our building sustainable. So. We are using microgrid, renewables, uh, as well as mixing and you know arbitraging uh, some of these energy sources to bring a greener source of supply into the building mm -hmm. using technology called resource advisor. So I think property, uh, I would say pro uh, prop tech space or technology that is being available to us can be deployed in a very efficient manner. And some of these is possible today uh, to make advances on uh, making buildings sustainable. You know. Hmm. Gina, would you like to uh, take it next? Yes, thank you, Dean. I'm going to do a little bit of a different perspective, if you don't mind, on that. So the question is, what are the what, what role will the advances in prop tech be making on uh, sustainability in buildings? Um, so my thing is, prop tech, a little bit on, on to what Manish said, it's prop tech is going to create a little bit more noise. All right. Um, you're going to see a lot more than you've ever seen. I mean, just, I think in the last few months, we've seen a lot of things about building management and, and building controls and all this stuff in, in mainstream uh, magazines like Forbes. Um, I, I don't think five years ago you would have seen that type of focus, right? And a lot of it is because of the investment that's coming in and funding some of the prop tech. And it's also probably because this is one of the very few industries left to really have a digital transformation or technology transformation. Um, and so it's getting a lot of buzz, it's getting a lot of noise. And I think that is actually going to have an indirect impact because as you see something, as you hear about something more often, it becomes less scary to you. Um, so I think that it brings more awareness so I think that that's one of the things that's going to happen with the introduction of more prop tech. And when I think of prop tech, I think of, um, you know, IoT sensors, applications, you know, it can be system specific, it can be application specific, things like that. I think the other thing is that it's going to bring on more competition, which is actually going to drive innovation. It's also going to drive cost and price. And so I think that that will actually help fuel sustainability. The other thing, and probably the most important thing I think about this, is that if you look at some of the prop tech companies now that are funded, and I think since um, I think since 2017, we've had about 700 new, you know, smart building companies. Um, so that, that's kind of a big, big emergence there. But I think one of the things that you're going to see is a lot of the, the companies or the founders or even the people in, working in these companies are going to be from a younger generation that grew up with sustainability um, and climate change and global warming as an issue. And so their perspective, I think, is going to be very, very different. And I think that that message, along with COVID, um, also impacting what they do. So I think in a in that way, when you think about prop tech, I think the, the and I hate to say it, the younger generation coming in, that's been their life. They've lived that, um, whereas we've learned it. Uh, I think that's going to have a, a big impact. I think the noise, the awareness, um, their perspective on the industry and on what's happening in their environment will, will 
definitely have a change, will definitely have a positive impact on sustainability. Jeremy, you want to weigh in? Sorry, for some reason I thought I was on mute there. Um, yeah, we find that property technologies are essential for how we deliver facility management services. But companies adopt these technologies, figure them out internally. They have some clients who are eager to get started and some who want to see it proven and effective first. Um, and it feels like, to Gina's point, it's becoming much more, everyone's ready to, to explore it. Maybe they're still not ready to pay for it, but it definitely feels like the pendulum is swinging that way. Um, and I would expect that, that Schneider Electric is probably seeing that firsthand and, and knows the demand better than all of us. Thank you. Jeremy, uh, Jeremy to complement you, I, I take an example of one customer, if Dean, you allow me. We deployed some of these technology solutions, they were early adopter, but you know, with deployment in 20 plus buildings across the world, they were able to see a million euro worth of energy saving very rapidly. So it was a good, good payback as well. So it's not anymore a question of cost because they know that the payback is very, very fast. Uh, so we, we are seeing uh, the motivation as these do pilots start to increase as well. And we're starting to get certain amount of scale, you know. Yeah. And then I think COVID and sustainability comes right to a nexus here because buildings need to be managed remotely and more flexible in operations based on who's in them, what day, like responding real time. And the systems we have for property tech will enable that. Um, some are ready now, right? We, we can do BMS optimizations remotely. We can through through fault detection systems and other tools that we use. And that allows those costs that stay extraordinarily high during a pandemic. You would think energy costs were coming down for, for most buildings, but maintaining them requires almost the same amount of energy, whether people are in them or not, uh, especially when there's labs in critical space. So. We really need property technology solutions that will enable us to do even more with that. Thank you. I've got a, an audience question here from uh, Jeff uh, Lincoln. It says, are there particular sustainability improvements uh, that we believe will soon be expectations or norms? I guess mainstream is another way to put it, rather than just a nice to have. Uh, Manish, you want to lead off on that? I, I can I can take that. I think uh, the, the the there is a more awareness and maturity in the market. We have seen uh, a lot of the specs coming out from new construction or even big renovation and modernization. And Jeremy, probably you 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 see that as well. And Gina is kind of you know, customer would like to have a very clear transparency and visibility into what's happening with their equipment, how much energy is being wasted. Also, what are the you know opportunities to save? So I think some of those visualization, all detection, diagnostic are becoming almost a base requirement in some of the buildings. You know, we see that uh, it wasn't the case. I would say three years ago or even four years ago, but now I see more and more uh, customers themselves or consultants on, on behalf of customers specifying that these are must-have requirement that I am able to see insights into my building. I have a fault detection diagnostic system that is telling me where my valves are stuck, may heating and cooling is working at the same time, which shouldn't be the case. Gina? Okay, um, again, I'm gonna take a different perspective on this question here, <laughs> um, go a different route if you don't mind. But I think that one of the things that you probably are gonna be seeing or have seen in the last few years is that people are gonna want systems that are open and transparent. Uh, so the days of buying a proprietary system, sticking it in and having it sit there for 15 years without any updates or improvements, I think those, those are gone. Um, I think uh, most facility managers, most building owners, they're looking for integration, interoperability. Uh, they want to own their own data. Uh, I think that's going to become mainstream. They're also going to expect that interoperability and they're going to they're going to want to utilize things such as APIs, um, um, and different ways to, to, to integrate any low, rate, low voltage systems. Um, so I think that's one of the, the mainstream items that I have seen, more demand for that. There's also the demand for, um, or I'm seeing recently, you know, cloud-based. Um, in a lot of, probably a few years ago, on-premise, on-premise, everything had to be on-premise. 
And I think that was a lot of the fear of security or cloud or not owning this or whatever. And I think that we're seeing that become uh, a little bit more acceptable. And I think you're going to see that a little bit more mainstream. Um, I think uh, people will realize that having something that's cloud-based um, actually affords you the luxury of being able to add applications in that prop tech, integrate with those third-party vendors, that third-party technology that you need. So I think they, they know that cloud would be the way to go um, in cases of another COVID, you know, access to be able to do something quick and fast, that flexibility, they're going to want that. So yeah, that's going to be mainstream and I see that happening. Jeremy. And I'd agree too with what Sophie says in the chat that well building standards and, and other wellness standards are becoming more prevalent. Um, and the good discussion there, I, I like love to see the chats on these topics. We, mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of focused pretty heavily on environmental sustainability. Um, but we've we've talked about sustainability at, at a larger scale as well with regards to social and, and governance factors. And wellness is perhaps most important in some cases because of that. We want our our people to feel like they have a good opportunity to come in. It's not like um, you know going into work with the flickering electronic lights and the bad air conditioning, right? We want to prove that it's safe to be here because of COVID. So now we're looking at how do we create an indoor air quality report, and that's a big workload for a facility management team. On the other hand, we can proactively address this with wellness standards or certifications, build it into our facilities and have it be part of standard operations. And that's one of those things that will become more prevalent. Thank you. Um, and I'll just put a, the, one of the challenges on here. Uh, I think PropTech has um, you know, some, some great promise for the future, um, but we've also got a heavy lift in, um, in educating the workforce. So everything down through those facility managers, maintenance technicians, um, many of these have not been a highly digital uh, profession, so to speak. And so learning how to uh, utilize those tools and the information that they provide is, uh, is a new training requirement that, that really uh, goes across the board on the industry. And I know we're uh, going to be running a little close on time. It's been great discussion. So let's move on to our uh, fourth question here. Um, so the experts assessment related uh, sustainable development goals reach no consensus. Um, are there just too many external factors to support consensus on this topic? And um, Jeremy, let me, uh, let me point to you first on this one. Sure. Thanks. So we didn't reach consensus, but it's really hard to know how many factors are in the respondents' minds. Um, we even looked at the sustainable development goals on an earlier slide today, and clean energy made the top 10, but um, sustainable cities and environmental impact didn't, right? So even within those goals, we have things we're talking about that we consider sustainability that come before that, ad addressing poverty, uh, equality, education, clean water, etc. cetera. So, um, I think we do have a lot of hope that there will be a long-term transition towards more and more sustainable features in general. Um, but I do think there are so many factors involved right now that it's going to take a long time to figure what the real priorities are and then make progress on them. Gina, do you have a uh, contrary uh, view you want to give us? <laughs> um. Yeah, to a degree, I, uh, I disagree. Um, I just think that the issue is there's no real clear driver for sustainability. Um, you know, I just, it's, you would, you would think it would be goodwill. Um, you would think it would be corporate reporting or, or something, but I think unless there's a clear driver for them to do it and what that clear driver is, whether it's, and it, it usually has something to do with the economics, right? Um, being able to share the value of um, a, a, a building is more uh, appreciates more if it's sustainable or uh, things like that. So I think without a clear driver, I just I don't think it has anything to do with the external factors. Maybe you call that an external factor, but I just think the real issue is what's a clear driver? What is the motivator? Yeah. Sure. Uh, I would say I think uh, definitely. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 
there are external factors like regulations, uh, etc. I think if we think about it, two or three fundamental, and that's what probably we see a different pattern in based on the geography. I think Europe is certainly a bit more aware, a bit more advanced, and that's also driven by uh, you know consumer expectations, uh, which is driving some of the regulatory environment as well. Uh, so I think it's difficult to reach a public conclusion because of the the, the factors. But I would say. Uh, in Europe, Green Deal, etc., consumer awareness is definitely pushing the boundaries to be more advanced, where I think U.S., we take a step back, uh, but the, the new government, I think there may be a revival coming. Uh, so I, I think, I think um, uh, yes, there are external factors that are sort of changing the pace, uh, and there may not be a consensus, but I think if you reflect back on a electrical vehicle industry is like a great example. Five years ago, there was not a consensus whether the industry actually will evolve but right now i think there is a there is a consensus reaching uh, that electrical vehicles is the future right uh, and part of it has also been fueled by the government incentive program i think similar external factor can actually take the industry uh, to the same maturity level where the base expectation is that your buildings have to be sustainable it has to comply with certain requirements it has to be i don't know lead or brim standards uh, and I think it will also raise the value of the property where investors and property developers will also come behind the uh, same momentum as well. And we see the signs of that happening. Thank you. And uh, let's move on to our last question because I think we have also a Slido poll we want to do at the end. Um, and that question is, uh, buildings contribute nearly 40% of the CO2 released in the atmosphere, and it's commercial buildings. Will concerns over economy and pandemic recovery overshadow the ongoing threats posed by climate change? And uh, let me go ahead and uh, again, I'm going to ask Jeremy to lead off on that one. Uh, sure. Thanks for the chance to speak on this. I, I believe in the short term, we've already seen them overshadow some of these concerns. We just know that when you do your next catering event and you're serving food, you're probably going to have plastic wrap around your disposable utensils just to protect everybody's health and safety. And that's a small example, but I think it applies like a paradigm in many areas. Um, I'm hopeful that in the long run, this will be a blip. Um, and I, I do think between government regulation and changing expectations from consumers and probably a little bit of hope that in the long run, we'll come back to being better. Gina? So actually, I, I agree with that one, Tommy, and I do think that um, sustainability is going to take a back seat to that um, because people are going to be worried about economy, recovery, and so going back to everything else, you know, not that I, I'm, I'm hopeful as well, it shouldn't be the issue, but it should be a priority, um, but I just, and I can speak basically on the U.S., um, you know, that, that's not really been historically uh, our, our driver's always been our economics. Mm -hmm. So I agree. Okay. Uh, Manish? Uh, I would say not, nothing more to add to what Jeremy said. We may see a small blip. I think uh, all of us have a role to play in, I think, uh, Dean, you mentioned earlier as well. I think this is the right thing to do for planet. I think we all have a role to play in our different, you know, part of the building ecosystem to drive the change management education and I think uh, sustainability is a is a easy, I would say, uh, uh, from a financial standpoint, uh, given historically it, it would have probably taken more cost to invest to get the goals. I think as the technology is evolving with AI, cloud, IoT sensors, openness, APIs, I think some of the sustainability uh, goals or ambitions are probably going to become easier to achieve. So I think we all have a role to play in terms of educating the market, educating our customer, but also being the role model by our own buildings being more sustainable as well. So I see that in the short term might be a bleak, but I think long term, I still am very optimistic and hopeful here. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. I'll just I'll agree with Manish on that one too, right? This is a chance to differentiate ourselves. Maybe we can look at it as an opportunity where if we can be sustainable now and develop solutions now for that during this time when other people aren't thinking about it, we'll exit the pandemic in a much better place to compete. Jeff, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, uh, yes, just just quickly because I see we're running out of time. Um, we also have to think that you know again it depends on the segment uh, of the built environment that we're talking about. But um, 
you know, there is an investment opportunity. And also, you know, it's never been cheaper to invest in many respects. The markets are flooded with cash, um, actually seeking opportunities to do things with. Um, so you have to see that component. And again, this is where, you know, that, that uh, public and private partnership could come together where um, you can have aspects focusing on job creation, certain types of of regulatory changes, tax breaks, and things like that. If those come to bear, um, to actually see it as a innovation job creation space, and we can actually see a transition. But you have to have that combination of political will, and that you know kind of relates to that question that we had before. Um, a lot of it came down when he reviewed the subject matter experts, uh, uh, political persuasions came out quite clearly in the comments about where the responsibilities lie for, for, for actions. But again, uh, it depends on the spin um, that's taken by um, the, public sphere, the public sphere and also private actors. And if we see this as a way to kickstart um, the economy upskill many of the uh, workers in the economy, as you were speaking before, Dean, about, you know, how can we upgrade our workers to be working in a more digital area, particularly in the FM space where they haven't been very digital before. This could actually be a means to do so. It's just the question of will and investment to do to do those actions. Thank you. Well, we are at the end of our time. We managed to, to fill it all up. And if we didn't get to some of your questions, uh, sorry about that. We'll try to um, you know, pull those off and see if we can get some responses and, and post them out there. Um, you know, uh, we did see the reminder that uh, to download the report. Um, I was also reminded we don't have a second Slido poll. I thought we, we had planned on one, but apparently we pulled that out at the last minute. So we don't have anything else. So with that, I want to just thank you all for attending today for this very important talk. And I'm, uh, in my spare time, I'm a climate activist, so I feel very passionately about uh, saving the planet. It's the only one we got. Uh, there is no planet B, as they say. <laughs> um, so thank you again, and uh, be sure to attend uh, the next session that we will have because we have more planned in this, uh, in this series. Ashley, back to you. Thank you so much, Dean and Jeremy and Nish and Jeffrey and Gina. Y'all have been just such an excellent panel today. And thank you to the audience for tuning in with us and submitting your questions. It was really interesting to see all of your discussion throughout. Um, just like, uh, as we mentioned before, all of this content, this webinar and additional resources are available at ifma.org forward slash coronavirus, our coronavirus resource center. And I'd also like to take a moment to encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to register for our facility fusion event, April 21st and 22nd. It is an online event and we are looking forward to it where you can get additional topics from great speakers all around the world. Also, be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date on content such as this and other great IFMA content. Thank you everyone for joining us today and I hope you have a great rest of your evening.